Hello, this is Dr. Wandia. You are about to listen to a recording of my lecture entitled Strange Fruit, Election Violence in Kenya, which I gave at the Moi University African Cluster Center on 10th September 2020. Karibuni sana. One of the questions I've been asking is what are the artists and the scholars of the arts, uh, performing arts that is, uh, what are we talk saying about uh, electoral violence in Kenya? Um, part of my concern is that I feel the scholarship has been dominated by media, by activists, and by maybe political science. And I feel that the arts has something more to say about electoral violence than than um, not than just uh, you know playing along with whatever the other disciplines are saying. It's not that what they are saying is n not good. It's that I think the arts can say something unique to the arts that other disciplines uh, do not say. So um, so what have they been talking about? One is a very dominant theme is the alienation of Kenyan citizens from statecraft. Uh, so the favorite topics are that people, we have conflict after elections because of land justice, injustice, and tribal favoritism. So the other theme in the scholarship is um, the fact that uh, elites, Kenyan elites, the political elite bargain with each other using violence. So uh, the electoral violence, as, as far as it, I mean, the elites are able to bargain deep with each other and of course with Kenyans in the extent to which the electoral violence will continue or not. Um, the other thing that is, com is a bit common but not as much is, the, is what the Americans call gerrymandering, where you play around with the electoral, either the electoral boundaries or the polling stations so that uh, the people who you think will not vote for you do not come to the polling station. So that is another uh, dominant theme in the studies on Kenyan election violence. And then the last one, uh, which is used, at, like was used by the US ambassador, uh, Bob Godek, was that Kenyans have age old rivalries. We are tribal, this is what we do, so we fight whenever we are not successful at, um, at uh, managing democracy. So what, what are my issues with these, two, the, with these uh, explanations? The first is the assumption that the principles of liberal democracy are the best for Kenya. So we are assuming when we are talking about electoral violence that one, we need elections for democracy to continue in Kenya, and that is why election violence is a, is a, is a problem. And many African scholars have been questioning this idea that, that elections and liberal democracy itself are the best for Kenya. And I think that conversation needs to continue. Um, the second assumption, which is the one that has, uh, is, is inspiring my talk today, is that when we fight with each other in, during, uh, after, during election time, it is a contradiction to elections and liberal democracy. And what I'm going to argue today is that actually the violence is essential to, to elections in Kenya. And, and that's now something that I would like to hear what you think because um, I, I haven't yet quite um, developed this idea, but that is the, the feeling that I have. Um, so um, the title of my paper, Strange Fruit, is, uh, is, the, is taken from the song Strange Fruit by, by a, a, a teacher. He was a teacher and a poet called Abel Mira. I've forgotten the second name, sorry. And the song became a hit when it was sung by the jazz musician Billy Holiday. Um, the song is about uh, lynchings in, in the American South and 
um, the, there was a camp the, during the uh, the 1930s, many people were now starting to campaign against these lynchings and demanding that the American government do something to stop the violence, which was meted against mainly black Americans. There were many people executed by this mode of violence, but uh, African Americans made the majority of the victims. Um, so I'll just read um, the first stanza of this song. Um, she's talking mainly, the song talks mainly about what was happening in the US uh, South, where um, the United States was dealing with uh, post-slavery uh, America and the economic um, implications in terms of uh, the participation of black Americans in the US economy. So the first verse says, uh, Southern trees bear a strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root, black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. And um, I forgot to mention at the beginning, I guess because of the technical issues, that this is a kind of not very exciting topic to talk about. But I think that's precisely why the artists need to be talking about it. We need to be talking about the actual victims of, 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 what, of, of electoral violence and not just the organizers. Um, so uh, first I want to talk about the function of rituals because I am looking at these, these kinds of violence in both the US and here as, as forms of ritual. So what are the functions of rituals? Rituals resolve a psychic need of the human being to come to terms with their helplessness in a world beyond human control. So ritual is the way in which we accept the, the, the limits of our abilities as human beings. Um, rituals uh, extend not just to politics but to our entire environment and our, even our humanity. So for example, rituals like harvest or even taking care of the environment, we have to, to perform rituals to come to terms with our, our being as human beings in, in, in the environment. Um, rituals also, uh, excuse me, I think I've gone off again, okay. Um, Rituals are also about uh, society, the fact that we have to live with one another. And rituals are the way in which we, we process our relationships as human beings. So you're talking about marriage, um, you know, how do we do business together? How do we live with one another? All those things that we sort them out through different kinds of ritual. And then there are also rituals for our own humanity. The fact that we grow up, the fact that we are children and we become adults, the fact that uh, we, we want to love other people and form a new family with them, the fact that we die, all these are, are things that we can't stop happening to us. And so we have rituals where we come to terms with these kinds of things and we come to terms together as a community. It's not just as individuals. So, so rituals actually are supposed to affirm a common human experience, meaning that it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, it doesn't matter whether you come from Eldoret or Athi River, we are all human, we are born, we love, we die. So rituals affirm that commonality between us, that, that no matter where we are, there are some things that will happen to us as as human beings. So th th that's why you find like weddings. Weddings are celebrated in all communities. The difference is now what, how we celebrate them. But we celebrate the same idea. Um, so when it comes to lynching, lynching is a mob, is a form of what we call in Kenya mob justice. Uh, it is where people come together to, 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 to meet out what they feel is, is uh, justice after what they consider an aggrieved, an ag uh, that they have been aggrieved. So for the US case, lynching was named after Charles Lynch, who was a, a, a judge of a, an irregular court. Um, 
and I've said that lynching is uh, just what we call uh, mob justice, which is extrajudicial killing by a mob. And I also said that most of the victims uh, between 1882 and 1951 were black Americans. And the reason that was given was largely a, an assault. The, the victims, especially blacks who were lynched, the reason that was given was that they had either assaulted a white person and many times that, that they had raped or attended, uh, attempted to rape white women. So to understand more about these kinds of extrajudicial killings, it's important to understand the social political background. This was the end of slavery. So we have a whole community of African Americans joining the economy uh, ostensibly as, as, um, as full citizens who have the right to uh, an economy, to, to, to work in the economy, but also the right to vote and have a, a say in the political leadership. Um, so uh, these, these, so when the lynchings increased, there were, I already mentioned there were campaigns against them by the female journalists, uh, Ida B. Wells, also by the uh, NAACP and many others who were campaigning against the, the, the mob violence because there was no indictment of the people who were organizing this violence. And many times the state, just members of the state, like the police, just helplessly watched by. Um, so because of there was a flux in the economic relationship between blacks and whites now that slavery was gone, people needed to affirm the inferiority of African Americans through this very morbid form of violence. Um, the performance of the ritual was that a mob would come together, and the mob would include men, women, and children. Sometimes the venues of, of the violence were um, outside the courthouse. So a mob would go, pull out a, a suspect from the custody, and perform the violence on him just outside the, the courthouse. Sometimes even the mob would gather at the church before going to, to, to perform this, this uh, extrajudicial killing. And we can maybe talk about that because that has something to do with the Christian idea of, of sacrifice. Um, so the other part of the performance was that the state apparatus, especially the police, looked the other way. Uh, the media that generally reported on these types of violence would, would justify the violence as, 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 as necessary for justice. Um, when they would get the victim, the mob would torture the victim. So the torture could be in terms of mutilation, use of, of uh, um, you know, amputations, and just very extreme violence before the body would, would be burned. And then the body might be displayed like if it was hanging on a tree, which is referenced in the song. Or there were photos taken, and the photos would be sent uh, by the mob. The members of the mob would send these photos to, to their friends. So what was the value? What is the ritual value of this violence? The ritual value was terror. To instill so much ter terror in African Americans so that they know their place, but it was also a form of solidarity for whites. So whites, whether you're rich or poor, the performance of this violence was to Im impose solidarity uh, um, amongst them, whether they were rich or poor. Then the other value of, of this uh, ritual was social control. So there needed to be a racial hierarchy with whites at, top, at the top and blacks at the bottom. And now that blacks could legally get the right to vote, participate in the economy, it was necessary to keep reminding them that their place still remains at the bottom of the hierarchy, and that's why there was this ritual. Now, I want to suggest now, before we come to looking at Kenya, that the state, the Anglo-American political arrangement that is called the state, whether we are talking about 
uh, Kenya or the United States, and I think this is the common, common link between the two countries, is that this political arrangement is not an organic one. So when I was talking about the functions of rituals, I was talking about rituals like initiation, weddings, you know, those are rituals that affirm humanity. But in the state rituals, the state rituals do not affirm humanity. They, they actually affirm hierarchies. So this was what was happening in the US when they were having this ritual, when there was this ritual violence. They are affirming not the commonality of people, but the disparities between people. So they needed to affirm that there's a division between uh, people based on the color of their skin. So it is, it is I would call it a pseudo ritual. It is not a ritual, a complete ritual, because rituals should affirm the common unity of humanity. It is also a pseudo ritual because it reinforces division. So in the other rituals I was talking about, when we have weddings, it brings all of us together, not just two families together, but a, a reminder to communities that this is the cycle of life for everybody. So in that way, rituals, uh, cultural rituals affirm our humanity. But in the case of this mob violence, the mob violence was affirming an ideology of fragmentation, of hierarchy of human beings between the human beings who must be served and the human beings who must serve them. So I'm going to look at, now coming to Kenya, to look at uh, two types of rituals. First is the elections as state rituals, and then election violence as also ritual. So those, I, I'm separating elections from election violence. So election violence is a ritual that serves different publics in Kenya, and I think this happens elsewhere. Uh, the first audience is the public. For, for the public, elections are a ritual of, of catharsis. The catharsis is supposed to release the tension between the fact that we have a state that doesn't respect the people, but needs to keep pretending that it does. So we, the reason why we have elections every five years is so that the state can say, you see, we were chosen by the people. It doesn't matter whether the people don't want uh, more loans to be taken from China, whether they don't want an express road, whether they don't want uh, more land grabbed, it doesn't matter. That All those things that Kenyans don't want are invalidated by elections, not even confirmed, invalidated. Because whenever the next person in office comes, he says, but I was chosen by the Kenyan people. I'm doing what I'm doing because I was chosen. So for, for, for us, we are given the, the elections for a catharsis so that we deal with the contradiction between uh, the, the vote that we cast and the fact that for the next five years, the politicians don't listen to us. So we deal with that contradiction through elections because elections provide a narrative that these leaders are there because we chose them which I don't agree with. Then elections are rituals for politicians. Politicians can pretend that they have popular support using elections. Um, and it also gives them international legitimacy. So if they want to go and trade um, with Britain or the US or Australia, the human rights groups in those countries will be asking uh, they are governments. Why are you trading with Kenya? And yet they are led by an autocrat. So when you have elections, you remove the possibility of that narrative. So the politician can say, uh, can go even to foreign media. And you've seen African leaders doing this. You go to foreign media when you're asked, you know, why did you do this? Why did you do this? They say, but it's the people. You know, I'm just doing what the people told me. And once the elections are, are legitimized, as free and fair, quote unquote, then, then a, an African leader has international legitimacy. They can do what they want and say, but I am the choice of the people. Then the last community that is served by elections is the international community and especially the Anglo-American empire. 
because this they, when African countries have elections, then American government, the American government or the British government can say, yes, we are a friend of Kenya because they are democratic and they have elections every five years. Look at how democratic they are. Um, we are proud to be associated with them. So whatever trade deals that the Anglo-Americans come up with here in Kenya, it's very hard for us as Kenyans to tell the international media these are bad deals for the people because New York Times has already endorsed the election as free and fair. You know, it's, it's almost like a way of, dis, of, you know, it's a ritual for them. They need our election so that they can keep trading with us without having to answer hard questions from the people in their home countries. Um, but the last thing that the international community likes to get from our elections is the racist idea that Africans are maturing, that we are not yet, we don't know how to do democracy yet, uh, but we are still being trained on how to be democratic. And so that is why we could have very patronizing speeches from the US ambassador telling us that Kenya is very far ahead of other African countries. We should be appreciate how far we've come. So it's basically saying that's a good boy. Uh, you Africans are trying. You're not that yet there, but you're trying. So that's what election, re, elections as rituals are for. Um, and, and when you look at the ritual, ritualization of elections, they have their own ceremonies. Like right now, the ceremonies have started. Ethnic incitement, uh, drama, you know. When you think of just even what the last two days, what has been being discussed, whether the president's mother was insulted or not, it's useless drama, but it's drama that excites. So Kenyans are kept excited about on useless stories uh, as a preparation towards elections. Um, we also have uh, the gadgets of, of the rituals, the ballots, the, the ballot boxes, the BVR is quite a big thing. And in fact, there's such a digital fetishization. We are treating, uh, uh, what do you call, technology as a fetish that can solve all our problems. So the problems that we were not able to, to solve institutionally, we are being told if we have BVR, if we have digital, you know, if we have technology, uh, that will solve the problem and we will have good elections. But what happens, the elections become more expensive and not necessarily better. Um, we also have the scapegoating of citizens. There's this narrative that you will see in the public sphere that all our problems caused by politicians are the problems who are, 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 should be blamed on the citizens. The citizens are being made scapegoats of politicians. So politicians can do whatever they want, but who gets the blame? The people who voted him in or didn't vote him in. But w the point is, to always put responsibility for Kenya's problems on the people and not on the main actors who have the power and the institutions to be, to be causing these problems. So that's another ritual element of elections. And then, uh, as I also said, uh, the other element is proving that we Africans uh, can be democratic. Um, I think we really need to look at what the, the media sometimes say. In 2008, um, I think it was in January, there was a journalist in the Star who, who when the, that time that was uh, the election violence was at its height, and a journalist wrote, I don't remember the name, but he said, and and I found it shocking now. I of course I wasn't paying attention then, but he said that look at what Kenyans are doing. He wasn't bothered by the violence and that people were dying. He was saying, look at what Kenyans are doing. We are such a democratic nation. This is not Somalia. This is not Congo. What are we doing now? The, the investors are going to be discouraged by the what we are doing, killing each other. So. Uh, and then he, he basically he was saying that Kenya needs to prove to the world that we are a democracy unlike other Af African countries. So that's what elections have been for. And you'll hear, you'll hear threads of that kind of narrative in, even in the politicians. I, I think I remember 
the president talking about that before the 2017 elections. The kind of, let's show that we Africans can do an election, basically. That we can, we can be civilized. Um, so how the performance of, of elections. Um, so now I come to the election violence itself. How is election violence performed? Uh, first is, I have already said there's ethnic incitement. So it's communities against communities. But there's another one, which is what we are seeing right now with this story of uh, the president and his mom, uh, intra-elite provocation. So we are seeing the other, I think two days or three days ago, there was, I think the deputy president was challenging his rivals, uh, his critics saying, if, if, you, if you don't agree with me, let's see each other on the, on the election, at the elections. So there's in, it's intra-elite, it's elites amongst each other, challenging each other to a fight. But you see, the fight is us. It's us who do that fighting and it's us who are killed. It's not, it's not them. So there's that performance before elections. Then another aspect of performance, and this was talked about by the KHRC uh, concerning the 1992 uh, election, not election violence and, and before. Um, there's a rural urban dichotomy in the kind of violence that is meted out. So you will see the people in the cities, if there's, uh, if there's violence related to elections, it's, it's police bullets. Um, and if it's in the rural areas, you'll see a performance with spears, uh, arrows, um, people running from heart to heart. You're told about uh, oathing as well. So there's, there's a, it's almost like we are being told you choose the civilized violence you want. Do you want arrows or do you want bullets? I mean, it, it's such a ridiculous kind of framing, but that's how election violence is framed. Um, and then there's also mutilation and mockery of victims. And I would bring Chris, Chris Msando here. The fact that his, that his body was mutilated when he was found, and then uh, Moses Kuria made fun of him and mocked him. And that happened also uh, in 20, after the election when we had the hashtag Luo Lives Matter. There's a mockery of the, the people who are victims of violence. And that is so typical when you compare to the US, that is so typical of how victims of violence are treated. And so for me, uh, when I look at uh, Msando, I just feel that that was a, a, a lynching. It was not just a murder. It was a, a ritual violence that, that accomplished a certain effect in the Kenyan public. Um, so what is the function of election violence um, as ritual? One is the same as we see in the US. It is a form of state terror. And, and when, when people die in election violence, this is how politicians traumatize us. They traumatize us and make us feel that we have no choice but to vote. So it is terror for us. We, and in fact, we go to the ballot box out of fear, fear of what will happen to us if we don't vote the leader we've been told to vote for. So I remember in 2007, 2007 2008, those of us who've never really subscribed to, to, to um, the current Kikuyu political elite were told, you see what will happen to you if you don't vote for your tribe? You know, who is going to take care of you when the violence erupts? So there's an assumption that there's going to be violence. And so people go to the ballot box traumatized and fearful of what could happen to them. And then, so for us, it is terror. But for the politicians, it's solidarity. Elections is what brings the politicians together. It's what takes them to Serena Hotel to talk amongst each other. So for them, it's solidarity. But for us, it's terror. It's fear. We go to the ballot afraid. Um, Election violence also constructs ethnicity and depoliticizes solidarity. What I mean is that 
the solidarity amongst sisi wananchi is the possibility of us reaching out to each other across tribe is 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 broken is broken by election violence because like i said you will be told you 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 are supporting a politician from the other tribe but what will happen if there is violence so you see the politician gains from from us being afraid of the violence because then we have to stick to our ethnic groups and stick there because in case there is violence um and that depoliticizes solidarity it means that we cannot come together as kenyans on various issues like work like jobs like economy like education all those things which we should be coming together uh, over we can't do it now because there is election violence in the background and everybody has to take care of themselves um it also means that we are constructing ethnicity through pain rather than ethnicity being a celebration of history of culture it is now a construction of pain we approach ethnic groups from a point of fear that i might antagonize somebody else and it might be politically uh, um it might have political implications and this is why especially when you have young people living in the urban areas with many ethnic groups they just try to avoid their ethnic groups because they've seen that the adults fight we their parents we fight and we kill each other and they don't want to be part of that but that means that we are removing as our ethnic cultures from culture and we are letting politicians mobilize around it and that is very bad for the for the authenticity and the growth of our cultures um election violence as ritual also is a performance of racism racist narratives of africans as backwards and so we find uh like like in the report by KHRC in 1992 the use of of spears and and arrows is deliberate it's deliberate because it affirms that story of africans as backward and so it, so politicians need us to fight using pangas they really do they need the pictures for the new york times so that in the washington post you see a poor young man doing this and then you 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 basically confirm that this is what black men are like so it it's a performance and then when they do that then the human rights groups can stop talking about police and human rights and the judges they can say these africans so somebody can say i saw new york times can say look at these africans or human rights groups as well they can say oh this is this is not the fault of the state or the police it's african culture and then um election violence out, is is a way for politicians to use violence outside the state structures so even though politicians are using money and from our taxes they are using uh, resources provided by the kenyan people they they cannot use also the police to meet out this violence so they need to do it in another way a roundabout way so that we vote how we, how they want and the way to do it is through performances of violence that defy the police that look very cultural and 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 african and then nobody asks them what are they doing um so what are the challenges i i think that this brings for artists and scholars of artists i think people in the arts need to challenge the narratives we are not challenging the narratives we are not challenging the narrative of backwardness of culture as the cause of our problems we are not challenging the idea that uh, uh, bad governance in kenya is the fault of wananchi who are the ones who are working and producing the labor that makes the government run and that makes the rich rich it's us who do the work and yet we are blamed for the actions of those in power so one of the the narratives that i think should be challenged is the peace messaging 
the the peace messaging that we have seen since by the way since 1957 i was very surprised that even elections in 1957 conducted and by the british government were in kenya were still talking about peace uh, and violence um i was very surprised again to discover that um when okay because of because of the 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 revolt the mau mau revolt the british had to perform some kind of election and at the time kanu was the dominant party but kanu was the party of jaramogi and and uh, kenyatta so there was peace messaging before those elections those local elections and apparently even there were tr there were troops and and colonial police and soldiers sent to to kisumu to prevent violence and and people were I, I i don't know about the the statistics i haven't read uh widely on this but this peace messaging and violence has been there before 1963 it didn't start with us so it's a function of the colonial state it's not a function of our cultures and it's not a function of the kenyan people so i think we need to qu question the peace messaging and because it makes wanainchi the scapegoats of the actions of others i think we also need to challenge the narrative that ethnicity causes violence because we are degrading our cultures by attaching violence to our cultures and we are causing younger generations to fear their own cultures because they believe that if they if they if they celebrate and, and leave their cultures that they might cause harm to somebody else um we need to liberate our cultures from the racist narratives which are being used against them the idea that kenyans cannot hold an election because we will fight is racist it's basically an idea saying we are so backward we can't handle an election and i think we in the arts need to challenge these narratives uh, before I finish, I just want, I, I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but I thought it was interesting. When the post-election violence happened in 2007, I had just come back. I came back three weeks from my studies and I was coming to be the Kenyan, building the country, building the nation, like that poem of Henry Barlow. So three, when I arrived, um, I, I hadn't been following Kenya news much, so I didn't know what was happening. I remember being struck by how toxic the, the conversations were on, on the news. In fact, I, I, I even was telling my parents, you mean people talk like that these days in public? I mean, I was so surprised. But so the, 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 when the violence started, I, of course, now I, I had thought I would, I would look for a job. So now I didn't know, now in January, I didn't know where I was going to go um, after graduating. So I, I talked to a colleague of mine uh, at University of Nairobi uh, in the literature department. So I was, I was telling him, you people are always talking about African cultures and oral literatures. How did we get here? that we are fighting each other in the name of those cultures. So that was when, um, that was the genesis of the idea of, of having a conference on uh, what oral literatures can do to, to, to address the, what was happening to us politically. And when we had that conference later in the year, after the election violence had ended, most of the papers from my discipline of literature were about peace. They did question what narratives are being told by politicians. What are politicians saying that is inciting us? So I'm challenging us in the arts to really look at the narratives that we are telling about ethnicity, about identity, about politics. Because if we look at these narratives, we will find that actually, the root of the violence is not us. It's not our cultures. It's the state and the way the state is structured to be anti-people. So whenever it needs to reaffirm itself, it uses rituals that uh, negate 
our humanity. And I see election violence in that light. I think election violence is necessary for the, for the elite, the Kenyan elite as they are, to, to continue staying in power. So thank you very much.